Merry Christmas Eve, everyone. It's great to be in church on Christmas Eve at worship. Uh, we are glad to have everyone here. We have some visitors here, some old church members. Uh, we have Stacy Robertson and Mary and Don Williams, uh, Dorothy sister and brother-in-law here who are old times and daniel gosh daniel i didn't know you i thought you were just sitting by dawn to be sociable <laughs> but it, it's a great morning to be at pleasant grove united methodist church and worship on this christmas eve be sure to sign your um, attendance pads that are in the pews, and be sure to check your Christmas mailboxes for your Christmas cards. Remember your white Christmas offering for the United Methodist Children's Home and our Christmas Eve service that will be at 530 this evening. Next week, we will have a New Year's Eve brunch at 9 o'clock where we will eat and fellowship together before Sunday school. So remember that. The church will be closed, church office will be closed December 25th through December 29th and January 1st and 2nd. Yes, Elias. Your birthday's on January. Well, that's a good thing, isn't it? Oh, let's all remember Robert Jasper's mother who had a heart attack and is in... Of UAB West and let's remember all who are on our our prayer list and those who are sick those who are grieving during this time of year are there any other announcements <laughs> did you hear that we need some volunteers for the brunch Sunday, and if you don't get in touch with Faye, she's going to get in touch with you. So, any more? If not, we will worship with the prelude and bringing in the light. Please stand as you're able and let's sing our first hymn, number 234, O Come All You Faithful. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 3. <coughs>
reading from Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace. For the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. We light this candle as a symbol of the Prince of Peace. May the visitation of your Holy Spirit, O God, make us ready for the coming of Jesus, our hope and joy. O come, O come, Emmanuel. I invite you to remain seated and let us sing together uh, verse 7 of hymn 211, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Let us pray. Mighty God, pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us gathered here. As we follow in Mary's footsteps, open our hearts that we might be filled with your goodness and your love. Live in us that we might bear the light of Christ for all to see. Overshadow us with your presence that we might truly be blessed and offer your blessing of love to the world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I invite the children to come forward. Good morning. Good morning. How are you all? I'm good. Are you excited? Yes. Merry Christmas. That's right. Okay. Where are the shepherds? Uh, right there. The shepherds right there. Where are the wise men? Right They're almost there, aren't they? Yes. And you know what? What's in the manger? I went ahead and put him there. Did you notice? Yes. Why is baby Jesus there? What's Tomorrow's Christmas, and what is Christmas? On Monday. On Monday, <laughs> who? Be Christmas. Right, Monday, which is tomorrow, is Christmas. And who was born on Christmas? Jesus. <coughs> all right, all right, good. Okay, here's the last Christmas I'm going to talk about with y'all. That looks like a fish. It is. There, how many fish there? Three. Why do you think they're fish? Why? Do you, do you know why? You have a guess? Yes. What's your guess? Because you love fish. What's your guess? The tails. Because of the tails. That's kind of interesting. Well, let me tell you, we've been talking about Greek words, right? Because that's the language the people spoke and all the different letters. Well, that's, okay, we'll talk about why there's three, and then I'll tell you about the fish. There's three in a circle because what do we talk about in church that there's three? Do you know that? Well, there are three wise men, but have you ever heard of the Trinity? Yeah. 
We talk about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So there's three, and that's why there's three fish, because we talk about God as being one in three. So it's in one circle, but there are three fish. Okay, when the way that you spell fish in Greek, the word, how we say it, is ichthus. Okay, there are five letters, but they stand for something. It's Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior. I think that's how it goes. <laughs> I usually spell it so I know. But anyway, that's why we use a fish, because it's sort of what we call an acronym. Have you ever heard that? We use the first letter of something to spell out something. So it's ichthus means God's Son, Savior. No, I said it wrong. Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior, is why we use a fish. And those early Christians, because they had to worship in secret, you know what they would do? They'd walk up to each other, and they'd draw a line in the sand like this. Can you see how I drew on the carpet like this? And if their friend did this, what would that look like? A fish. It looked like a fish. One would draw this line, and then the other would draw that line, and then they'd know that was their secret code, that they were a Christian too. Okay. Because <laughs> it was a fish. <laughs> All right. Let's say a prayer. <laughs> Gracious God, we thank you for sending Jesus. Help us to celebrate his birthday with joy, knowing that it's because you love us that he came. Amen. And I've got, I'm just going to give this to These are women. Um, I invite you as you're able to stand with me as we read responsively a piece of scripture. This is from Luke's gospel, the first chapter. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior, who has looked with favor on me, a lowly servant. Okay, well, you'll have to look in your hymnal to find it. It's not on the PowerPoint. It's number 199. And we'll just start over. <laughs> My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior, who has looked with favor on me, a lowly servant. From this day, all generations shall call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is the name of the Lord, whose mercy is on those who fear God from generation to generation. The arm of the Lord is strong and has scattered the proud in their conceit. God has cast down the mighty from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. God has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. God has come to the aid of Israel, the chosen servant, remembering the promise of mercy, the promise made to our forebears, to Abraham and his children forever. Amen. Please be seated. I invite you to join me in prayer. Holy God, source of our light and salvation, you bring hope and peace to all people. During this holy season, as we remember what happened so very long ago, we can't quite imagine what it must have been like for Mary, who so quickly responded with an unconditional yes. We have a tendency to put conditions on everything. We want to know what we have to do, how long it will take, what's in it for us, and what will the outcome be. Forgive us for our unfaithfulness, Lord. Slow us down. Help us to take time to really consider <coughs> the wonderful ways in which you have worked in our lives. And Lord, you know there are many concerns we hold in our hearts 
concerns for our families, our friends, and our world. Help us to lay those things before you this morning. We especially pray for all those who are sick in body and mind and spirit, who are in need of your healing touch. We pray for them and for all those who care for them. Strengthen each one. Give them courage and faith for each day. Lord, we lift before you all those who grieve. Wrap them in your comforting arms that they might know your presence in a very real way. Remind us all that you are with us, that your healing love comforts and restores us. Open our hearts and our ears to hear the cries of those around us. Give us courage, energy, <coughs> and enthusiasm for your work in this world. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to stand as you're able for the reading of the gospel. The gospel comes from the gospel according to Luke, the first chapter, starting with verse 26. 
In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. Of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. <coughs> Have you ever been so in love with someone that you would do whatever you could to impress them? Okay, I'm not going to tell a story about Ron. <laughs> but for many of us, our first experience of that kind of love we call puppy love. That feeling of love and devotion when we're just first learning what it means to love another person and we just really want to be with that person and do all we can to make them love us. Have you ever thought about why they call it puppy love? <coughs> well, if you've owned a puppy, you know why. <laughs> I mean, that little puppy, oh, they are giving of such love and devotion that we really don't deserve. Um, when you have that new puppy, they want to be with you. We had a little dachshund puppy, and I worked at home, and she would sit in my lap until she got too long, and then she couldn't sit in my lap while I worked at the computer. So she'd sit at my feet. She couldn't stand it that she couldn't be in my lap. And when you'd come home, how that whole body would shake with their tail because they're so excited to see you. Most of all, they want to please us. If they can figure out what, what we're asking of them, they try to do it. Puppy love, that desire to do whatever the master, whatever the master asks, and to give as much affection and complete devotion to the master. I had that image in my mind when I was thinking about a servant's heart, but that's not really how we think about a servant, is it? For me, my image or definition of a servant has been shaped by the PBS series Downton Abbey. Now, I don't know how many of y'all were fans of that show, but I watched it religiously. Um, I, if I missed it on Sunday, I watched it Monday morning on my computer. But it follows the life of Lord Grantham and his family, his three daughters, and they live in the manor home, which is called Downton Abbey. But it tells not just the story of the upstairs, where the Lord and Lady and their family and all their friends live, but the story of the servants as well, who probably lived up like on a third story, but worked in the basement. And what was interesting to me was to see that life of the servant and the pecking order that even existed among them. I mean, it depended on what your place was, whether you were called by your first name, your last name, and whether you had a Mrs. or Mrs. Mr. in front of your name, depending on where you were in that hierarchy. But the bottom line of it, they didn't do what they did out of devotion to the Lord and Lady. They did it because they got a paycheck. They were paid employees. They might have had positive feelings toward their employer, but they did it because it was their job. So when I say having a servant's heart um, as the, the title of my sermon, I'm not sure that the servants that we normally think of have that kind of a heart. 
um, of blind devotion and faith and obedience that comes out of a desire to please the master. I'm not sure the staff at Downton Abbey had that kind of an attitude. What about us? Is our devotion to God out of a gratefulness, a sense of obedience and gratefulness to God? Or is it because we think there might be a reward in the end? There might be a paycheck at the end. Is our heart like that puppy devoted to the master? Or are we just working for that paycheck? Mary had a servant's heart. Mary willingly submitted herself to do what God was asking of her. Her words are a model for us. Let it be to me according to your word. She said that gratefully, willingly. Do we say the same thing? Let it be to me according to your word. And do we say it begrudgingly, hoping that perhaps at the end of the day there might be a reward that comes our way? Now, our dogs may obey us because they think there's a reward or a treat that they're going to get, but they also love us and want to please us. And that's the kind of heart I want to have, one that desires to please God, to serve God, to do what God asks of us. And Mary is our model of devotion for that. Mary faithfully submitted herself to God's plan. She submitted herself to do what God was willing in her life. Let it be to me according to your word. How many of us say that to God? When was the last time you said to God, here I am, the servant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. Do with me what you will. God doesn't ask us to do anything equal to what Mary did. And yet we do find it hard to submit ourselves to God, don't we? We find ways out of doing what God asks us. I just don't think I'm able to do that. I don't know if God's really calling me to do that. Well, you know, we've never done it that way. I just don't think it's going to work. How hard it can be for us to choose to submit ourselves to God. How hard it can be to let go of our own desires and look towards what God desires for us. Today, there were two pieces of scripture that we read. This piece that I just read from Luke's gospel is often called the Annunciation because the, Gabriel, the angel Gabriel is announcing to Mary what's going to happen in her life. The responsive reading, which we read, is called the Magnificat. And those are also Mary's words, and they actually happen after what I read. I realized that when I started to read it, It's confusing in this translation that it says, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel came. What that means is in the six months of Elizabeth's pregnancy, because the story right before this is about Elizabeth and um, being told she's going to have John. And so these words in the Magnificat that we read happen when Mary goes to visit Elizabeth. And they are Mary's words about what is happening and what God is doing through her in the birth of Jesus. She's saying there's going to be a reversal of sorts. Mary, who's a humble servant, understands that God is coming in a very unexpected way, not as a conquering king from the sky, but as a baby born in a manger, a very different way than perhaps what was expected. And she says because of that, The proud are being brought low, and the humble poor are being lifted up. In his book, Not a Silent Night, Adam Hamilton talks about why God chose Mary to be the mother of Jesus. He says, because God looks with favor on the lowly. Mary believed that God chose her precisely because she was not of noble birth. Her qualifications were that she was humble. She had a heart for God, and she was willing to offer herself wholly to God. Hamilton goes on to say that the entire Christmas story is about the reversal of values, and therefore one way to see the story of Jesus' birth 
is about a, that it's about a call to humble ourselves before God. I would say it's about a call to have a servant's heart, a heart that desires to humbly serve God. Sometimes when we hear the words of the Magnificat, we hear it as a threat because we're not necessarily hungry or poor. Now, we might not think of ourselves as rich or proud either, but sometimes when we're successful, we hear those words as a threat. But really what that, those words are about are a call to humble ourselves before God. Because one of the things to understand about humility is this. The powerful cannot demand God's love and acceptance. God's grace cannot be bought. God's love, no matter who we are, is given to us, and no amount of power or money can get it for us. Part of our celebration of Christmas, of the birth of the Christ child, is about unmerited grace, about love and acceptance that is given to us even when we don't deserve it. So what is your response when you hear the announcement of God's grace coming through the baby Jesus? What is your response when you hear God calling you to be a humble servant? Do you have the heart of a servant? Humbling yourselves before God means offering ourselves as Mary did, being willing to follow wherever God leads. Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. As one great preacher has put it, Mary was the first disciple. She displayed radical trust and obedience. She modeled faith, obedience, servanthood, discipleship, and hospitality. She is an ordinary woman who was called to do something extraordinary. God calls ordinary people. And through God, extraordinary things are accomplished. It's because Mary was humble and willing to do what God asked of her. Do you have a servant's heart? Or are you working for a paycheck, some kind of payout in the end? Or do you find yourself loving God with a devoted heart? With Mary, may we also be obedient to the point of saying, Here I am, Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Might we, as Mary, be people through whom Christ comes again into this world that so desperately needs God's love and grace. Amen. I invite you to stand as you're able as we sing together, What Child Is This?
please be seated and I invite the ushers to come forward. Let us pray. <coughs> Gracious God, we give you thanks for the gift of this season, for the gift of friends and family. We give you thanks for most of all for the gift of Jesus. We pray that you would inspire us to be light and life, to serve you in humble obedience. And Lord, we offer back ourselves, our gifts, our tithes, that truly your love and light might shine in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. standing for our last hymn, number 242, Love Came Down at Christmas.
May you go forth to love and to serve in joyful obedience to God. Let it be to us according to God's word. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.